One night, many years ago, I went to see a fortune teller at a carnival on the outskirts of the town I used to live in. I was 21 years old, in love with a girl I had no idea if she liked me back, and I had no idea about what I should do. Or at least in that case until a friend of mine whispered to me about the carnival and how I could see a woman there who could offer me some insight. It wasn't news to me, because so many people I knew quietly whispered about her to me and how good she was. And if I'm being completely honest, there was the subtle element of a dare and how everyone quietly mentioned it to me. So, once I had decided to do it, I went to see her late one summer night. I had the drive out in the middle of nowhere to get there. I'd been camping plenty of times before, but never this deep in the woods. It was so thick it almost didn't feel real, and the carnival that had been set up there seemed even less real. As I walked towards the ticket booth, the crickets and other insects humming in the air seemed unnaturally loud as they zoomed past me. Behind the ticket booth, the carnival itself seemed to loom out of nature so vividly that it was like a hallucination. And when I actually set foot inside it, it was like sensory overload. Everywhere I looked, there was something to see. Some vendor selling something, or some performer displaying some type of skill, or putting on a performance while people gathered around. There were a million smells. Some were the usual fried carnival foods, and other were things I had never encountered before or since. Some of it smelled delicious, and some of it smelled off. But either way, it was all memorable. The space was illuminated by strands of lights that were suspended above our heads by tall wooden posts. I could see numerous bugs fluttering around the lights as I walked in. It seemed like I had walked forever until I finally reached the tent where I had been told I'd find the woman I had been sent to see. There was no line, and the small sign instructed me to enter. Not only was she dressed casually like any other woman you'd encounter anywhere, she also looked beyond ordinary. The only thing that gave even the slightest hint that she was in any way unique was her eyes. They were blue, but they seemed to cut through the darkness with a sharpness I had never seen before. It was with those eyes that she read tarot cards in my palm for me by the flickering light of a few candles that were placed in the middle of a large table. There was plenty of incense burning, and the combination of that, along with the heat and being inside the closed tent, was beyond heady. Don't worry, she eventually murmured. The opportunity will present itself to you, and you will recognize it. And when she was done speaking at length, and it was time for me to go, I mentioned I was going to see the show taking place in the main tent. This got a humorless laugh out of her. What? I asked. I never found it particularly entertaining. If anything, it always struck me as beyond morbid and a bit like the people in the show were tempting fate. That made me stop. Why was that? But before I could ask her, she merely smiled and said, Don't worry, you can go. Nothing bad will happen to you. Since the show was about the start, I dutifully left the other half of the money promised after she had done her job and left the tent. After being in the closed tent with incense burning, the fresh air felt beyond refreshing on my skin, and I gladly took several deep breaths while I headed for the nightly show in the main tent that was being advertised on the signs all throughout the carnival. 
It was only long after the night was over that I really thought about what she had said. How she had emphasized the you part of her statement. But of course, this was a long time ago. Long before the thought of doom lurking around every potential corner was at the forefront of our brains. Especially because back then, one typically does not readily admit to seeing a fortune teller. As a born and raised New Englander, I was raised like most of my peers were, with a thorough knowledge of the area's history and the fears of witchcraft that defined an era. And old habits die hard indeed. Back then, things like freak shows, carnivals, and the circus were a novelty. Because if you wanted to see and experience bizarre things and outrageous behavior, you had to deliberately seek it out and make an effort to see it. Unlike today, where everything you look, there's a metaphorical circus or freak show, and thanks to the internet, you could look at it any time you want from the comfort of your own home. If you've ever wondered why freak shows fell out of fashion, it's because in reality, they didn't. They just got rid of the giant tent, called them something different, and eventually daily life turned into one. I tell you this to understand why there's the notion back then that people viewed carnivals and stuff like that with such suspicion. It's like the idea that you should never ride a ride at certain places because it was probably assembled in the parking lot by someone on minimum wage in an hour who may or may not have been sober. For better or worse, Many things that people don't even blink at now had a much seedier reputation decades ago. But none of this was in my head as I walked towards the largest tent and joined the trickle of people going inside and getting seats around a large ring that was separated from the audience by tall metal dividers. There was a sense of excitement in the air and it didn't take me long to get inside and find myself a seat that was both close to an exit and offered an excellent view of the ring. This was in July of 1964, and I don't know if the heat around that time period set any records, but it certainly felt like it. But isn't that how it goes? The summers of youth are always the hottest and brightest, just like the winters of one's childhood are simply the ones with the purest and heaviest snow. That's how it should be. Of course, the flip side is that the terrors of childhood can also cast the longest and most intimidating shadow. So I cannot be sure whether on record the humidity was so thick you could cut it with the knife, but it certainly felt that way. As I sat there, the sweat was dribbling off my nose, and I could feel my shirt was soaked before too long. And I wasn't the only one, because I could see that for several clowns who were there also gathered in the audience, their makeup was beginning to run. The effect was more than a little creepy. The first thing that came to mind when I thought of that night is the tent. This was no crisp red tent you see like in the circus. No, this thing was old, faded, and stained in spots. And within minutes, you could smell the sweat pouring off at everyone with a vengeance. It all definitely made for an atmospheric experience. Even today, I could still see how frayed and patched together the section of tent by my seat was. Although it wasn't exactly a full house, there was a good-sized audience. And literally, every single one of us was melting by the time the lights started to dim to signal the show was about to start. We were all fanning ourselves or using handkerchiefs to try to dab away the sweat while the ringleader strolled out. He was tall, lean, and wiry and dressed to impress in a red velvet suit with gold tassels along with white riding pants and black leather boots. He was by far the best dressed person I had ever seen, and it was worth every penny they spent on it. Because the minute he stepped into the ring and the spotlight lit up his features, 
he looked flawless. Not only did he ooze charisma just standing there, he didn't seem to be uncomfortable at all. And I didn't see a drop of sweat anywhere. It was bizarre. A hush fell over the people gathered as the ringleader stood there silently, waiting to grip us in the palm of his hand with whatever he had planned. Then he began to speak. And if his presence was impressive, that voice was in a league of its own. It was otherworldly, simultaneously commanding and inviting, a rich gentle hum that could lull you to sleep and snap you to attention at the same time. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen! He greeted us with a dazzling smile that lit up the space. Thank you for joining us tonight. For your viewing pleasure, something you won't see anywhere else, I present to you, the Beast! Right when he spoke, several of the lights illuminating the front of the ring dimmed so that all of the attention was in the back of the tent, where there was a slight ruffle of the tent canvas being opened that was followed by a loud shriek as the sound of something large and metal moving towards us grew slightly louder. We all craned our necks to look, and saw the sight of a massive steel cage in the back of the arena, containing something huge being placed strategically in a space. As my eyes adjusted, I could see it was being manned by four huge men that if they weren't bodybuilders, they could easily be mistaken for them. One of them took some keys out and unlocked the cage, and the massive shape inside lurked out and stumbled into the space. There was a shudder of nerves in the audience, and I saw that it was what looked like a giant dog on two legs. Or at least, that's what it seemed. It could have easily been a guy in a costume, or any other number of tricks. But if it was, it was the best trick I'd ever seen, because it looked beyond realistic, with glowing red eyes that loomed out of the sticky night air. I watched as the ringleader casually extended his arm and saw that he was now clutching the end of a rope that seemed to have appeared from nowhere. With a well-practiced maneuver, he gracefully used it to climb onto a raised wooden platform overlooking the space that was safely out of reach of what he called the beast. Although we could all now see that there was a massive metal collar around its neck that was attached to a chain, the end of it which was being tightly gripped by a team consisting of the four massive men plus two more additional men that had came out of nowhere. All of us silently sat there rooted to our seats, and not knowing what the beast would do as it slowly walked into the ring, looking around at the audience and silently took everything in. I was vaguely aware of the ringmaster calmly informing the audience that this was a rare monster found somewhere in the woods of the Midwest. But all of my attention was on the beast. I was relieved that I was sitting farther back and had all the other people in front of me because had I been closer, I would have sworn this giant dog thing would have been able to pick up my scent and remember it forever. Don't ask me why I thought that, but I felt it as sure as I was sitting there. The beast itself was just standing there, taking everything in. If I didn't know better, I say it looked bored. But moments later, something in the tent changed. I could feel it in the air as sure as the pressure from a thunderstorm, because I wasn't surprised when the beast suddenly turned around and looked off to the right. All previous boredom was gone as it crouched down and began to crawl. There was more than a few yelps and whimpers in the audience as the ringleader let out a knowing chuckle and said, Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, everything is alright. Right on cue as if to mock him, the beast dropped all subtlety and began to roar at someone in the audience before rushing forward and attempting to lunge into the crowd. The men holding the chain frantically tugged it back, 
but I could see them straining to keep the thing under control. From somewhere deep inside the tent, several more men came forward in the attempt to restrain the dog monster, which now had its massive claws out and was swinging them in every direction. That is the moment when everything started to fall apart. From somewhere inside the tent, someone screamed, and that one scream turned into several with plenty of yelling and even a little swearing to join in while many of the people started to leave their seats, me included. You know those stories where someone owns a big dog and it comes running up to a person and the owner frantically tries to assure you he's friendly and it turns out he's not? What happened next was that dialed up to a thousand. It even came with the ringmaster loudly trying to reassure us that everything was fine when it clearly wasn't. Because we could all see with our own eyes that literally nothing was fine, as the giant dog man thing was trying to attack everything and everyone in sight. And unfortunately for one of the men trying to control it, the beast landed a blow onto his arm, and its giant claws ripped into flesh like a saw. Within moments, the coppery scent of blood filled the oppressive tent air, and we were all choking on the smell while frantically trying to reach the exit. Several people tripped on the run towards it, and as a result, several other carnival goers were inadvertently also dragged to the ground in the mayhem. From somewhere inside the pandemonium, I saw one of the men take out a giant syringe and attempt to jab the beast with it. I can't be 100% sure because I was fleeting with the crowd, but I'm pretty sure he pulled it off because the beast let out an angry howl a moment later. As we all stumbled our way out of the tent into the thick night air, there were a few people staring at us, but once they got sight of several people covered in blood, they got the message and started to run. At one point, I looked back, and one of the smaller tents had caught fire, and it was kicking up some incredibly thick black smoke that you could smell for what seemed like an unnaturally long distance. After about an hour of running through tents and general chaos, I made it to the parking lot and found my car. People were roaring out of there in cars in any possible direction, and I was no exception. Once I got my car started, I punched the gas and floored it out of there. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I was soaked in sweat as I left the chaos in the rearview mirror. But the story of that night wasn't over. Because once I managed to get away from the chaos, I drove to a diner I knew about 30 miles away. It was late by then and all the adrenaline had made me hungry and in need of caffeine. So I walked inside, grabbed a seat at an empty counter, and looked at the menu. Fancy seeing you here, an amused voice said. I quickly looked up and found myself face to face with the girl I was interested in. I had no idea you worked here. I didn't until last week picked up a shift here to put some extra money away for when I go back to college this fall. Makes sense. So, do you know what you want? Uh, yeah. I'll take the patty melt, some fries, and some coffee. Then she wrote it down, placed the order, and brought me my coffee. Two sugars, and then we started talking. And talking. And then when my food came... She talked and I listened. Then we both shared a piece of apple pie with ice cream, because by then it was just the two of us left in the place. And we've been together ever since, and still talking after all these years. I also kept waiting for word of the carnival incident that make the front page news, but it never did. Not the front page the second page, or even a mention in the back. Nor was there ever any report on the evening news. It just ceased to be mentioned. 
I'm not sure how I feel about that. Just like I'm not sure how I feel about how no one asked me what had happened there or how my trip to the carnival went. No one, to be a journalist, cop, or one of my friends ever asked me about that night. <laughs>